Hello, and welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Coffee Conversations with Scientists. I'm your host, Raina Andrews, and if you're tuning in here for the first time, let me introduce you myself. So I'm a mother, a children's book author, a public health advocate, a TEDx speaker, an engaged community member. I am happy to return as your host of Coffee Conversations with Scientists for the 2024 season. And since 2021, we have been sharing the science behind today's most important health topics. Coffee Conversations is brought to you by Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, which is a statewide nonprofit working to improve health and advance health equity in Wisconsin. So today's topic is, is near and dear to me because I think you'd all agree that what's inevitable is someday we all have to die. But most acutely grieving adults are resilient recovering their pre-loss functioning within a year. However, there's a significant minority um, that develop complications such as prolonged grief disorder or complicated grief and bereavement related to depression. So the development of these complications is especially high following the death of a life partner or a child. So we're really going to unpack this topic today with our special guest, Dr. Joseph Gobius, who is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral medicine with the Institute for Health Equity and vice chair and director of geriatric psychiatry, psychiatry at the Medical College of Wisconsin. We will be talking about the consequences of prolonged grief disorder and bereavement related depression. So welcome, Dr. Gobius. Thank you, Raina. Yes. So for those of you tuning in, what I love about this show is that it's live. And so we encourage you to type your questions in the in the chat and we will get to them by the end of the show. And I will try my best to get to all of your questions. OK, so we only have 30 minutes for a quick coffee break. So let's jump into it. So, Dr. Govius, I understand that you have a very personal reason for why you chose to focus on grief. But let's let's lay the foundation for our audience to talk about what is grief? What does it mean? Why is it so important? Why should it be a public health concern? Thank you, Raina. You, you're asking a very uh, uh, personal question and it's a wonderful way to start this uh, conversation. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I lost my dad when I was eight. Uh, he was uh, very young himself. He was 44 years old. He died from a heart attack. Um, it was an unexpected uh, and an abrupt loss. Uh, it left a huge void, a very painful void in my life. Uh, so uh, as you might have heard, you know, there is uh, the saying that we just have to move on and uh, we just have to live uh, our lives and grief just goes uh, on its wayside. And that's not necessarily my experience uh, when I was grieving. Uh, and so uh, I became uh, a psychiatrist and I'm now a grief researcher because of my own personal connection with, uh, with grief. Um, so um, let me define grief like you asked. Grief is a universal uh, human experience after losing a loved one, like you described. It's a natural process. It has no predefined endpoint. It can occur across your lifespan. Um, and so it's important to first emphasize that grieving or grief itself is not a medical or psychiatric condition in the vast majority. Grief and grieving, um, you know, you, as Queen Elizabeth II uh, described grief as such, she said, grief is the price we pay for love. Um, mm -hmm. And so losing a loved one who we are closely attached to uh, trigger an intense emotional experience that in most individuals uh, is transient. Um, and after a few months, let's say six to 12 months after losing a loved one, uh, the grief quiets down over time and we adapt to the loss. Um, we find meaning and purpose uh, and we re-engage uh, um, in uh, uh, things that helps us feel happy. Um, and and uh, we are able to regulate our emotions and that adaptation, it's a process, it's a learning process, uh, that adaptation uh, and the transition that goes through that adaptation, we call the outcome integrated grief. You could call mm -hmm. it resilience or uh, it's a very loaded term, resilience. So I like the term integrated grief. But in a select minority, about seven to 10%, um, who lose a loved one, an attachment figure in their life, grief becomes prolonged intense and pervasive, and it affects their day-to-day -day functioning. And it, that, that symptoms can linger on for years, and that's what we call prolonged grief. Um, and so 
uh, to answer your question, um, thoughts and behaviors and feelings originate in the brain. And so how to how understanding how the brain works or function as one navigates through this maze of grief uh, will help us identify who might be on the trajectory of integrated grief versus developing prolonged grief. And that's what our research focuses on. Great. And just to really set the tone here, when we're talking about grief, we're talking about the loss of a loved one, such as a life partner or a child. But could you also grieve um, a relationship or an opportunity? Are those also levels of grief? Oh, there is gradations of grief. Uh, you know, gr grief uh, can happen after retirement, retiring from work. Uh, grief can happen after um, we lose a pet um, that we have had for years. Um, so uh, romantic relationship uh, and loss of a romantic relationship, loss of, uh, uh, some people describe empty nest, uh, uh, nesters to be grieving as well. So mm -hmm. there are different gradations. What we are focusing on is grieving, loss of a loved one. Got it. And so with this, you talked about acute and prolonged grief. So are there clinical manifestations of acute and prolonged grief? And do these have implications for overall health and well-being? Like, are there symptoms that we should be looking for? So acute grief that is something that anyone who's lost a loved one and in that first six to 12 months goes through. Um, and so the symptoms vary in, in uh, its individual. There is an individual variability in that. But you know, you, you could experience a constellation of symptoms, um, intense yearning or longing for the deceased person, preoccupation with thoughts and memories of that person who died, intense emotional pain, um, sadness, sorrow, anger, bitterness, uh, emotional numbness, uh, difficulty concentrating, for instance, sleep and appetite changes, um, and intense loneliness or even avoiding the reminders of the loss uh, could all be symptoms. When these symptoms happen in that first few months of grieving, it, it, it's, it's a natural process. Uh, we mm -hmm. experience it uh, and it, we kind of go through this yin and yang of, uh, of oscillating between experiencing this pain, but then also needing to function on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You know, mm -hmm. engaging in new roles and responsibilities and new identities due to the loss. Um, we may have to table the grieving process for some time, but it, you go through this oscillation between dealing with grief and tabling grief. But over that time, if the symptoms recede, then that means you're transitioning into integrated grief. But in people who have this same intense severity of symptoms that persist over uh, over 12 months um, and for years, that's what we call prolonged grief. This is really good. And I think you have a visual for this because I think it's important for our audience to really see the transition between um, the threshold of the grieving brain. I really want us to unpack the science behind it. Um, can we show the visual of the grieving brain, yes, or, or acute in, grief. Yeah, the course of acute grief. So you can look at it uh, from this visual, you can appreciate that everyone who goes through the loss bereavement um, would experience acute grief. Acute grief itself, when it's very intense, can lead to um, medical uh, illnesses, uh, decrease in uh, uh, or changes in our lifestyle that we make it can also lead to other physical um, and emotional uh, symptoms that could affect one's functioning, maybe transiently in many. But in the 7 to 10% who develop prolonged grief disorder, um, that's where we worry because these individuals have enormous um, adverse consequences that they could, uh, um, they could have, including cognitive decline, um, medical illnesses could get that they may not have had could start to surface that wow. may get worse and even leading to premature deaths um, um, including by suicide and that's what the concerns are oh wow this is a very helpful visual you know it makes me think how does grief impact memory and cognitive function like are there connections between grief and conditions like forgetfulness or difficulty concentrating it's an excellent question reina you know the we, we we know very little about the 
uh, about the grieving brain. And, and this area, what you are uh, uh, asking, is also an understudied area. But there is some indications that in those with prolonged grief, they experience poorer attention span concentration, but more importantly, difficulties in decision making and in memory difficulties. In fact, some individuals, some early results show that in some individuals with prolonged grief is associated with future cognitive decline, especially in their memory performance over time. Um, why that happens, we don't know. In our own study, we found that in people who are acutely grieving, a study that was led by, co-led by one of our imaging scientists, uh, Dr. Nathan Blair um, in our lab, and also Dr. Hoffman, who is actually a past medical student who was in the lab, now a radiology resident. We found that in acutely grieving older adults who especially experience intense symptoms, they perform poorly on decision-making attention and processing speed. Uh, now, can these um, cognitive effects either, either during the acutely grieving phase or in the prolonged grief, does it accelerate the development of Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia and how that happens? We don't really know. This is one of the many areas our research program will be focusing on in the future. You know, when you talk about the the, the smaller or the minority population, seven to ten percent still seems pretty high. And so, of those who experience prolonged or complicated grief, are there long term effects on the brain? Yes, um, again, an understudied area. Um, uh, you know, uh, but well, I'll let you know what we know at this time. Mm -hmm. It's an area that we are focusing on a lot. We do know from very early, there's early indication that in prolonged grief, there is an overall decrease in brain volume than people who are non-grieving, okay? Mm -hmm. We don't know what areas are shrinking or are atrophying. It might be areas that deal with mood and affect and memory, um, but we don't know that. That's something we are looking at at this moment, okay? There yeah. is also one study that is very interesting in line with your question about cognition and, mm -hmm. and memory that showed that in people who are widowed, widowed older adults with higher amyloid deposition in their brain, this is the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, um, have a three times faster rate of cognitive decline than married older adults with higher amyloid in their brain. So is widowed older adults more susceptible for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, we, it, it, that finding raises that suspicion. Um, we have been leading the way of understanding how the brain works or function. And we use different functional MRI technologies that we, are, we have at our, at our disposal here at MCW to study the grieving brain. What we do is we look at two areas, two brain circuits. These brain circuits deal with emotional regulation and another deal with reward processing. So you can think about losing a loved one, an attachment figure in our life. It can trigger an intense emotional experience that leads to dysregulated emotions. And so we think that emotional regulation circuitry in the brain is probably aberrantly functioning. And so one of our new, uh, assistant professors in the Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Guy Wong, a brilliant neuroimager, he hypothesizes that aberrations in brain circuitries that underlie emotional dysregulation will be seen in prolonged grief. And his early findings, thanks to the pilot funding from Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, helps us support or test this hypothesis and support this, this theory that we see that higher activity in the amygdala, a limbic brain region implicated in sadness, storing emotional memory and detecting threats seems to be hyperactive in people with prolonged grief and may explain some of the key symptoms seen in, in grieving individuals. Another widely accepted theory is something we are testing too, which is the theory of attachment theory. There are close bonds that we form with our attachment figure. As a child, for me, it was my dad. 
as an older person, it could be our spouse or a parent or, a, or another family member or a friend helps us reduce distress when we are faced with adversities. So these close relationships gives us purpose and meaning in life, okay? Now, we're finding that when we lose that attachment figure, the reward circuitry in the brain seems to be hyper-firing. Wow. And, and we might be seeing this also in people with acute as well as prolonged grief. And one of our other imaging scientists, Dr. Blair, who I earlier mentioned, is looking at the reward circuitry in the brain. Wow, this is so fascinating. I'm so happy that you're able to unpack really the science behind it and some of the research that's being done. Now, I want to talk about the DREAM program. So can you share with us what the DREAM program at the Medical College of Wisconsin is and how it really supports individual ex individuals experiencing grief? Yes. So, uh, so great question. So you're, uh, we kind of talked about this here. There are a significant number of individuals who are acutely grieving, who actually uh, transition into integrated grief. But there is that select minority who actually develop prolonged grief. There is another slide that, um, that I would like to put up at this time that shows bereavement and, and its other consequences uh, that possibly Michael can help us uh, put forward. Bereavement also is linked to other com uh, um, uh, complications, depression, anxiety, PTSD, if we witness a violent death, substance use, uh, and all of those can also contribute to bad consequences. And so what we're also trying to do at this time is to understand if the select minority who will, we want to know what's happening in the brain early on in the acutely grieving phase in these people who are who end up developing complications of uh, the grieving process, prolonged grief, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. If we can identify them early, we can probably probably prevent complications from developing. And that's something that the DREAM program likes to focus on. DREAM is an acronym, as you know, Reina. It stands for developing resilience to ease anguish in mourning. And so we want to de decrease and calm down the grieving brain so that everyone can go on that integrated uh, grief pathway. And that's our goal. That is amazing. Um, and you can check that out on the Medical College of Wisconsin's website, more information. Dr. Golias, I'm happy to share that we have a very active audience today. And I wanna turn right now to our audience's questions. And one of the questions is, how does guilt complicate grief? So um, this is a very, very good question. So one of the derailers of the grieving process. So when we say there are factors, there are, psych uh, there are behavioral uh, factors, um, thoughts and feelings that promote the healing process, okay? And, and that, is important uh, for, for people who are transitioning through that acutely grieving process through developing integrated grief. But there are factors that block that healing. And one of the factors that block healing, he, um, among many, we call them derailers. I didn't coin the term derailers. My colleague at, uh, at Columbia University, Dr. Kathy Shear, coined that term derailers. It stands for an acronym. And one of the derailers is the self-doubt and guilt, including survivor guilt that someone might experience. When you experience joy and satisfaction, you feel that you are not, you're not, uh, you feel guilty of doing that. You feel guilty of feeling that joy and satisfaction. And you embrace the idea that intense grief is the only way to honor the person who died. That is a painful state of affairs, and it blocks the healing process. We call them derailers. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, along those lines, another viewer is asking, how does post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, affect grieving a loss of loved ones? PTSD and prolonged grief coexist. So there is 
as you can imagine, there are unfortunate circumstances where we, uh, some of us would experience our, a violent death of our loved one, someone who's near and dear to us. It could be from suicide, it could be from homicide, it could be from an accident, um, and we're witnessing that person. PTSD is re a real um, issue and can develop within months of experiencing that loss. Um, and so it, the presence of post-traumatic stress disorder in during that acute grieving process facilitates, um, or I'm sorry, it impedes um, uh, the uh, healing process and it facilitates the development of prolonged grief, we believe. Now, these are all work that is in the early stages. In our own study that we are doing, we are finding that there are possibly brain circuit abnormalities that might explain prolonged grief symptoms and, prolo and PTSD um, in, in different areas of the brain. Um, and, and so um, it might be worth we, we are, at least I speculate that treatment of PTSD is of paramount importance for someone's recovery or the healing process to be facilitated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, talking about the healing process, there are quite a few questions and I'll combine these, the, these next two questions. One viewer is asking, um, or they're sharing that they've lost three friends in the last year and they're really struggling with worrying about losing others in their life. And, and they're inquiring, is there a good way to work through this or will it just lessen over time? I'm, I'm very sorry for your losses. Uh, you know, as we age, we, we are uh, going to see more and more, experience more and more losses happening, uh, sometimes in quick successions, unfortunately. Um, grief, grieving for each loss is unique. Uh, th it, there is no way to grieve uh, each loss, and 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 uh, each family member grieves uh, differently. Each friend grieves differently. Um, there is no right or wrong way to grieve, uh, and there's no right or way wrong way that uh, I could actually predict someone who is going to uh, grieve. Um, but there are certain things we can do uh, for ourselves as we go through the grieving process. We can, of course, focus on our own self-care um, and and being compassionate towards ourselves and and to people who are grieving uh, in our lives. Um, we can also understand what the acronyms of the healing um, healing acronym healing milestones stand for that facilitates healing. We can also watch for the persistence of derailers uh, in each individual. Um, and so all of those things are important. We can encourage healing uh, in individuals. We can, we can facilitate ourselves if we are grieving. We can get involved in more activities and interests uh, that we were we found joy and purpose in, uh, in life before. We can, be op we can open oneself to experiencing the grief itself, the emotions itself. You know, the experiencing is what um, in the past or now even we call as grief work. Um, we can gather people around us. We can gather around other people. We can share stories. We can share pictures. We can address social isolation. We can find creative ways to stay connected. We can create memories or rituals. We can ask for people to help us, uh, you know, ask for help, right? We can go for grief counseling. We can have support groups. We have spiritual support. We have friends. We can find ways to socially connect. We can just listen to others. We can communicate compassionately. If we are not, we have been one of those fortunate individuals who has not been grieving. We can communicate compassionately. We can just listen to the pain and suffering. Um, we can also refer people when appropriate um, to a mental health provider or to a grief group. Um, grief share uh, is spir uh, our spiritual grief groups that are, uh, you can find spiritually oriented faith-based grief groups around um, that are in the, in the communities. Um, and there are so many different resources available that we can help people and educate the grieving person that they're not alone in this process. I think that's really helpful. And along the lines of educating the grieving person, you have someone who's experiencing grief due to the loss of a loved one, but it could also be where um, the person who isn't experiencing grief, but 
wants to support the person experiencing grief, what would you suggest as a way to best support them? Are there things that they should say, they shouldn't say? How should they kind of kind of redirect them to really help break that cycle of grief? Reina, you, you bring a, a question that we often struggle with as human beings, right? You know, what to say when someone is grieving. Because usually um, I just avoid it. It's like, I'm sorry for your loss and I have no idea what to say after that. Yes, and and you're not alone. You're not alone, and you're uh, you're like all of us, including me. In certain situations, there is nothing we can actually say. Right? We can just listen. We can have our empathic presence. Um, you know, one of our colleagues from New York, uh, Dr. Leikenta, uh, uh, um, came up with this wonderful acronym called CARE, uh, and and she said, you know, CARE stands for C stands for communicating compassionately. It's offering condolences like you did, uh, Reina, but then being offering an empathic presence, listening compassionately, acknowledging how difficult this might be, but not saying upfront, I really don't understand. I don't know what you're going through. Um, and ask how they are coping. Offer to be there. Um, communicate that you're available to them, right? And then A stands for assessing risk for the bereavement challenges. You can assess risk. You might be more of a person who can know that and identify them. Assess social isolation. Evaluate their social network systems around them. Screen if grief is affecting their ability to cope and function. You might be able to pick it up better than they themselves can. Mm -hmm. R stands for referring when appropriate. Um, be mindful that intense feelings of grief, someone might be going through PTSD or depression during their acutely grieving process. There is help out there. Um, mental health provider assistance may be needed in a select few, even in the acute grieving process. Um, and E stands for educating about resources. You know, there are hospital services, chaplains that are available. We have uh, wonderful bereavement resources. We have a wonderful Southeast grief network in, uh, in, in, in Southeastern Wisconsin available that many people don't even know about. Um, Is the are... actual title Southeast Grief? Grief Network. Uh, go okay. Yeah, it's as simple as that. Um, and and it's, a, it's a hidden gem. Um, we here at MCW, have a wonderful grief clinic um, that is got um, uh, trained therapists uh, led by uh, Dr. Amanda Levin uh, in, in the Department of Psychiatry. She's a psychiatrist. We have therapists like Anne-Marie Husselman, who's a grief therapist, a seasoned grief therapist. They're, uh, they're all trained in, uh, in a therapy called as prolonged grief disorder therapy. The only psychotherapy that or an intervention, you can say, that has been rigorously validate, validated and found to be efficacious in people with prolonged grief. And, and, and we have the resource available here at, at MCW. Uh, and then there are bereavement resources, grief share. If someone wants faith-based grief groups, grief share is something that is a click away online resource. Um, and then uh, the brief counselors, the, the, uh, the brief bereavement coordinators, the hospice counselors, the funeral services, uh, the funeral sent, uh, um, um, or programs, uh, the services, all of this are, we are doing, we are, I'm very interested in mind body interventions. We are doing a yoga study here um, in people and seeing if, uh, Something like yoga can calm down the racing mind. Um, and, and so a lot of uh, resources available uh, in people to alleviate the pain and suffering in people who are suffering from prolonged grief disorder. Mm -hmm. So just to put a pin on, on this question of the resources, if someone is looking for more um, psychiatry therapy, what would the title of the practitioner be? What type of psychologist would they be looking for? So um, we have excellent grief therapists in Southeastern Wisconsin, people who have been doing therapy for longer than I was probably born. <laughs> you know, we know so, so I was be, being in this world. So, so there are people who are seriously, they're wonderful therapists around. Um, help is uh, just a click away, as I say. We have a lot of resources on our website. Um, you can just uh, 
you can just type www.mcw.edu slash dream, D capital R capital E A M, all in capitals. Mm -hmm. And you will find a lot of resources on the website. Um, you can, uh, uh, and, and, and the clinic, a clinic is listed on, on there. The other resources, uh, uh, support programs are listed there. And there are many more. Thank you so much, Dr. Govius. And with that, we're at time. I want to thank you for sharing your time and talent with us. This has been very, very helpful in helping me understand the science behind the grieving brain. And so thank you. Thank you, Raina. You are just wonderful. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. And for those of you out there viewing us, if we didn't get to your questions, I'm so sorry, but please feel free to send us a note at conversations at mcw.edu. And so I hope you all enjoyed this, this, this coffee break. We hope to see you next time for Coffee Conversations with Scientists. See you next time.